Dr. Patnam, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to do this interview. We're going to start with a rather difficult question because we're going to ask you what you think are the main challenges facing, first of all, the UK and secondly, the world regarding sustainable energy provision in the context of climate change? So a big Oof, question. Very big. Well, let's uh, kind of separate out the, the challenges. First of all, there's a huge challenge, which is a public perception challenge, yeah. which is the, the challenge that suggests that there's not much point in the UK doing much as mm. less than 2% of, uh, of global emissions unless the other countries come to the party. Well, the analogy I've tended to use for that is, um, believe it or not, is uh, the Wilberforce, uh, the abolition of slavery, because exactly the same arguments were used uh, in that particular context, which is what the point of Britain mm -hmm. abolishing uh, the slave trade when, in fact, other countries... Uh, Holland, France, Germany, uh, would immediately would just fill the breach and step in and, and, and the slave trade would go on mm -hmm. and Britain would be massively disadvantaged. The other part of that argument was that uh, the slave trade, one way or another, and this is the argument the anti-abolitionists made, was um, uh, that, that it represented 25% of the UK's GDP, 25%. Mm -hmm. Try to imagine today advancing an argument which is going to exactly. knock 25% off of the UK's GDP, and yet... Yes the nation decided to do it. It became a moral issue. Uh, there was a, a sense that uh, this nation needed leadership. And surprise, surprise, the UK did do it. Uh, the Dutch um, and the French didn't step into the, 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 the breach. There was, there was a sense of, um, of uh, an upsurge of, of, of uh, abolitionism in those countries as well. And we created a, a very serious and important um, moral position for ourselves. I believe the UK can do exactly the same. We, we do have the world's first mm -hmm. climate act, something we can afford to be quite proud of. Challenge number two is going to be selling it to the generation that's going to be most affected by it. And that means getting engaged or engaging with a massive public information uh, job and a, and, a, and, a, and a kind of an attack on people's behaviours. Mm. Attack's probably the wrong word. Um, now, again, we have some advantages. The... I've, I, my experience of environmental radicalism tends to be among five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. So we do have a kind of something going on in primary schools, which is well worth building on. Challenge now is to take that through and transition it through mm -hmm. into secondary schools and have an entire generation of young people leaving school, understanding absolutely that they would not be able to, as it were, have sustainable lives on the basis that their parents, their grandparents did. So those are, I think those are pretty chunky challenges. Oh, absolutely. But in, th that's in terms of the UK. That's the UK, specifically. So um, what about the challenge for the rest of the world? The challenge for the rest of the world is literally, uh, first of all, to rebalance economic expectation. Yes. It is for the developed world to understand that it has the primary responsibilities in dealing with this. And it's for the developed world that developed 100 and 200 years ago to realise that in a sense they have accumulated more of the blame than anywhere else and to find a way of rebalancing. Now, the, I've read some very good stuff. I think a lot of good work has been done on, on moving nations forward in such a way that you begin to create an equitable uh, relationship by 2050, let's say, nation to nation. So I think the world's got its head around that. Whether it's going to get its head around it soon enough is, I'm not absolutely sure. That's right. But it does mean that, you know, for the first time in history, successive generations will in some senses live more impoverished lives than their parents and grandparents. Now, that's never happened before. So we're not quite sure, none of us know, how human nature will cope with that. Um, I'm a relative pessimist. I, I'm one of those people that believes that we will wake up and understand the implications of what's happening. But unfortunately, it's likely to be a little too late and we will already be past the tipping point. Um, sadly, that's the way I see it going. Perhaps I could pick up on that. that uh, uh, I mean, do you see that as a, a breakdown of communication between scientists and policymakers and the public? I certainly don't blame the scientists. I think the scientists have been, for the most part, saying the right thing for quite a long time. Uh, maybe they weren't saying it loudly enough. Maybe they weren't saying it insistently enough. Maybe the very nature of scientific research and the relationship between scientists and government, and not just in the UK but globally, was such that uh, scientists didn't feel that it was their position to be quite as strident as they might have been. I don't know if one or two did. Um, and there was also a problem, and this is a very, very profound problem, that it only needed three or four reasonably eminent scientists to question all of this, and that you've got this, you know, this issue of balance in the media, that, that the, the climate deniers were given far too much space and noise 
and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and credibility at a pivotal moment, I think, five, six, seven, eight years ago, when in fact we could have got the show on the road and, in fact we're, and we're being stopped from getting the show on the road while the world, President Bush in particular, tried to decide whether, there was a, a man, whether this was a man-made or a man-assisted crisis or not. So your question's a very good one. I think the relationship between science and government is, is always tricky. You know, what does represent um, sustainable science? What does represent uh, responsible science? I know that I've talked to Bob May about this. I've talked to David King about this. I think both of them feel they went as far as their remit allowed them to in terms of being pretty tough with government. But it does suggest to me that um, government has a way of silencing scientists when it wishes to. I think we would take a more general view of scientists than that, that as complex system scientists, we're interested in socio-technical systems where it's not just the, 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 the physical um, science, but also the social science and the interplay between those two things that we think is, is difficult. And that would bring us to policy. So, I mean, how do you think uh, scientists can can communicate their own views on policy in some useful or even meaningful way. Well, the irony is, and I read a piece the other day in the New York Times about exactly this, I'm not sure scientists help their case when they cross the, when they cross the, the road, as it were, into policy, because that's when politicians go, oh, just a minute. Uh, I think the important thing is for, is for scientists to be very, very clear and using every single medium they can lay their hands on what the science suggests. They then have to be equally clear that this is an issue that politicians and policymakers have to deal with, have to, have to address. I think that once scientists start, address, start to um, get engaged, over-engaged in policy creation, as it were, uninvited, you immediately have a problem. And my experience of government is that in a strange way that feeds, that feeds the neurosis that politicians have about their, um, their policy-making um, processes being interfered with. So this is a very, very interesting and very difficult area. For me, the role of the scientist is to shout as loudly as possible, these are the probabilities, what are you going to do about it? And, 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 and keep saying that until, until... You know, the greatest single weapon in, in politics is embarrassment. In, in a sense, it's the role of the scientist to embarrass government into action. I certainly agree with what you say, but I think, uh, particularly going for this science of complex systems, that uh, it is tr important to try to understand how human systems will behave in the future. Uh, I certainly think that it's not the business of scientists to, to dictate policy, that we don't have either the mandate or the money to do that, but I think we have to be kind of junior partners in a, in, in a team with the policymakers. I wouldn't argue with that, but what I would suggest, were, were I advising scientists in the best way of handling uh, politicians is I would set, lay out a set of policy options with very yes. clear indications yes. to which of those policy options would appear to be the one the, the, you know, the, the most advantageous the most and, and, and the most possible um, but I th again I can only say having dealt, dealt for the last dozen years with the neuroses and, and sensitivities of politicians uh, it, it is a bad idea to challenge their primacy in policy making and you've just got to be cuter than that Okay, well, you're a very entrepreneurial person and you're involved in both uh, uh, entrepreneurial things and public policy. How do you think that the public and private sectors can work together to address the, the new needs that we have for, for energy and sustainability? Well, I'd like to say that public and private sectors would sit down together, look at the options, uh, look at the dangers, look at the threats, look at the opportunities, and work together in a very sensible way. Unfortunately, um, certainly in my experience in the last three or four years, is it doesn't quite work that way. Um, you know, I'm quite right. I'm an entrepreneur. I've also worked in companies most of my life. And I try to say to politicians, look, do you, have you ever been to a board meeting? Do you understand what the, what the objectives of a board meeting are? The objectives of most board meetings are shareholder value. And under the guise of shareholder value, it allows you to do all kinds of things as a normal human being you wouldn't necessarily do. So I'm afraid I have a dismal, uh, a lot of dismal experiences of people leaving their humanity outside the door of the boardroom and making decisions which are, in some senses, not human at all. I don't want to say, quite say inhuman, but are not particularly human, but are justified by this catch-all phrase of shareholder value. It's that something that government has a real problem getting its head around. Add to that the fact that governments, certainly in the last dozen years or more, have been almost in awe of business. You know, the notion, and it cropped up in the mid-'80s, the notion that business were the great wealth generators, business were the people who were going to see us right, and that government's job essentially was to get out of the way of business and facilitate business rather than regulate business, took hold very powerfully. And it's only actually in the last six, seven, eight, nine months I've heard people 
actually arguing sensibly and cogently about rebalancing the relationship between government and business. Uh, now, if you can rebalance it, if you can get it right, then of course they can work together. But if we continue to be either in or, you know, if we continue to be awestruck or feel ourselves to be enthralled to business, then no, that partnership won't happen. You said earlier about the engagement of young people through the schools. Um, project. Now, again, coming from a complexity perspective, we're very much aware that until you get the engagement of the individual um, citizen and communities, it doesn't matter how much you do top down, it will not ultimately work effectively. So, what is it do you think that both governments and perhaps the European Commission can do to? encourage that engagement of the individual citizen and of communities? I think they have to, government, the European community and indeed governments mm -hmm. generally, have to find a way of shrugging off their prejudices and attitudes. I am making a speech about this, funnily enough, and uh, uh -huh. this gives me a chance to rehearse Good. it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm calling it the Radio Caroline moment. Now, you've got to be as mm -hmm. old as me to know what that uh, means. Yes, I do. <laughs> there is a moment where there are things yes. happening in yes. the ether yes, exactly. that mainstream governments and indeed mainstream yes. organisations, in the case of Radio Caroline, it would have been the BBC, mm. cannot grasp. Mm. And it isn't until the public make that shift. You know, it isn't until someone wakes up and says, just a minute, I've been pressing my ear against the radio, listening to Radio Lux Luxembourg uh, for too many years now. I actually want to hear it on my radio. You know, give me a radio that actually acknowledges my taste and interest in music and doesn't deny them. And I think what has to occur, and it will occur without doubt, hopefully it will occur within a democratic process. If not, it will occur far more painfully. Um, that young people have to be given a voice. Young people, it seems to me, have grasped these issues far better, far, far better than the older generation by generation, and indeed far better than politicians. And sooner or later, politicians will start listening to that voice and working through their policies in some way accommodating that voice. You know, you had a very good example recently with um, uh, the, fourth run, the third run rate at, at, at Heathrow. It's a very, very important issue. As someone who commutes to Ireland, I live in the west coast of Ireland each week, of course I want an effective and efficient uh, airport, but in a sense, by the very fact I do it, I'm, I shouldn't be given a voice. What do young people who have looked at the science, looked at the options, worked out the ramifications for them, and then seen that those ramifications, those options, effectively ignored, what do they then do? The truth is, it may well be that we need a third runway, but what it needs is that someone in government to say that the way in which we will accommodate the third runway is by making these massive changes over here. We'll find a way of doing this because we've decided that this is the least worst option. Don't pretend it's the best option. Park cannot be the best option, but it may end up, on balance, being the least worst option. But it needs a generation of politicians to have the courage to say that and to engage with these very, very legitimate concerns uh, of young people. It is the young people in this country and, and indeed in the, in the whole of the world that will be massively affected by all of this. And they must be given not just a voice, a voice, a vote, and if anything, if you like, the final say. Now, there is also something, I think that is very much in terms of engagement, but there are also some perhaps very practical things that a government can do to help individual households. I'll give you an example. Um, in order to install a solar panel in a house now, today, it's very expensive. Yeah. That's just an example. Is there anything for that the government can do to make that more accessible, uh, more cost-effective, etc., etc. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is, are there practical aspects that the government can help to get that engagement of the households um, in the immediate future? I'd, I'd love to say yes, and I suppose in some senses I, 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 I could say yes, except that unfortunately I was involved in the 1997 manifesto. If you look at the 1997 Labour manifesto, we made a very firm commitment about the insulation of houses, particularly among the old. Uh, most of the technologies you're talking about ex either existed or at least existed in, uh, uh, were, were, were in the research labs. Had we made these commitments in the year 1990 or the year 1997, I would have wholeheartedly agree with you. I have an uneasy feeling that in 2009 or 2010, we're moving rapidly towards that type of palliative, and it is a palliative, 
will be far from sufficient. And if we start looking at, th at those things as the answer, then my, my prediction that we will come to terms with the crisis too late, I'm afraid, I think inevitably will pr prove correct. Perhaps I could uh, pick up on that. You are you're the Chancellor of the Open University. How do you think that an institution like this could contribute to problems of energy supply and sustainability? Well, I think the OU, first of all, has colossal reach. Um, and, and as we know, not just in the UK. It also, uh, admirably, I think, has tried to consolidate its, 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 its organisational brain around these issues and has done something a lot of other universities, in fact, a lot of other institutions have been unable to do, including government, I might add, which is to bring all the possible ramifications, all the possible thinkings together to try to come up with some solutions which, uh, which frankly, very different disciplines can, can gather around and agree on. So... I think the OU can be a, a powerful catalyst. I suppose, if nothing else, what the OU can prove is that when you bring the very best brains to bear on a subject and begin to gather together different views and different possibilities, something important can happen. Now, unless government, central government, can do that, I mean, it talks, both, both parties, it, government talks collaboration. Government talks uh, the cross-departmental working, cross-departmental responsibility. But I'm afraid I have enough experience of it to know that government finds it all but impossible to work cross-departmentally and all but impossible to get its collective brain around a single problem until it goes to war. It's a very important thing to say. Until we regard climate change as a war, ironically, a war with ourselves, it's a war with our own behaviours, until we see it as a war, we will not solve it. So long as we keep thinking that it's a kind of an issue or a problem, or one among many, we are not going to crack this. This is war. Do, do you think that analogy uh, really is the one that we should have, that uh, we, we, we've just come through the war on terror, which um, was, not, uh, was not very effective? Um, do you think that this is, this is a more abstract problem that we really can take that mentality towards? David King said, and I think I've got the year right, I think it was in 1999 he made a speech, or 2000, when he said that climate change represented a far, far graver threat than terrorism. And at the time he was pummeled, both in the press and indeed by one or two politicians. He was profoundly right. He was right then, he's even more right now. Because it is longer term. Of course. <laughs> Quite a lot of um, scientists policymakers and people from industry will be at the seminar tomorrow. Is there anything you would like to say to them in addition of what we've discussed, either on the scientific or on the policy side? On the, I'm not qualified to say anything on the scientific side. I wish I was. On the policy side, yes. All my experience of government, going back, working with government, going back over 30 years, tells me one thing. Unless you speak to government with an absolutely united voice, Government is brilliant at using your internal divisions to defeat you. You cannot afford one scintilla, and this is very difficult scientific community, one scintilla of difference. And this is why I was suggesting, for example, that when on, on offering up policy options, allow a range of options, make it very clear which of those options you think is going to like, likely to be the most successful. But do not agree on any component of the core problem, because, as I said, one or other of the departments or one or other of the officials or one or other of the people who are, in, are engaged with, in, in effect, trying to keep business as usual will use that division as a, as, as a means of, of splitting you and dividing you. That's what governments do. They do it brilliantly. So I beg you, come out of that conference with a single voice, a single but identifiably s uh, similar range of options and a very clear uh, pathway forward. And that, hopefully, will get the kind of headlines, will get the television programmes, will engage, will engage the media in a way that you need to. The last thing worth talking about, I think, is we should talk about it, is the role of the media. The role of the media so far has been something close to disgraceful. One, uh, I'll needless say one or two heroic examples. The Independent the newspapers have done well. One or two of the other papers have done well. Others have, have exploited the divisions in this debate. As a, in, in a way, as a way of selling newspapers or, or even uh, television. My own organisation, Channel 4, was lamentable in putting on that uh, great climate change sc uh, swindle. It was a dreadful programme and, and has done massive damage. Um, the media have got to understand that they are part of this. They've got to be pressing home all of this. I absolutely believe that I will live to see, 
I'll probably be pretty old, but then I will live to see personal carbon credits. I will live, I'll ironically have been born into a world where I had a ration book, mm-hmm. and I will die in a world where I'll have a ration book. I can cope with that. What I can't cope with is the idea that the Daily Mail and other similar papers are railing at the fact that this is a fundamental assault on my liberty, because my ration book is my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren's liberty, and they must be made to realise that. Perhaps I can pick up on the uh, aspect of children, since we've got a few more minutes, um, that one of the the projects that we're uh, hoping to get off the ground is to... um, it is to have a, a programme of education with children, a large programme of education with children in Milton Keynes in our local city, where they can be calculate, learning how to calculate their own carbon footprint and the, the cost of, of things. And um, my, my own belief is that this will uh, be a way of, of informing their parents, that the children will get interested and, and communicate this to their parents. Do you, do you think this is a, a reasonable approach to trying to... Uh, disseminate ideas about uh, I think, sustainability? I think anything like that is a good, a good approach. I'm, I chair an organisation called Future Lab, which looks at use, ways of using technology to advance knowledge and learnings uh, and pedagogy, um, or translating it into pedagogy. All I would urge you to do is focus on things which are quite quickly scalable. I'm afraid, again, if I'm looking back over the last dozen years, I've had a pretty miserable experience of wonderful experiments, wonderful pilots, wonderful ideas that never went to scale for one reason or another. What's vital with this is we find something simple, mm-hmm. that's effective, and that can quickly be taken to scale at a price that's affordable. And I even add only, only add price that's affordable, of course the price should be affordable, but I'm being a realist. Uh, so yes, absolutely go for things like that, but for God's sake, take them to scale, take them to scale fast. But one of the great uh, opportunities of our modern world is, is the use of the internet to do scalable things. So all this social networking and so on gives us huge new possibilities um, for the challenges we face, I think. Yeah, I think the internet is a fantastic weapon. Uh, and I was looking for enough this morning at, at um, some things being done of, on the health front. The key there is finding ways of giving, of, of rewarding young people for taking, for, you know, for taking time and getting engaged and getting involved, and indeed rewarding families when the entire family gets involved. Uh, I come back to my business of the Radio Caroline moment. It does require a significant shift in terms of in terms of policy making itself, it does require people to start thinking in ways that they haven't thought for a long time. I carry around with me, and it's a wonderful thing, and that's the, the issue of picture post from January the fourth, I think, is uh, 1941, just a month before I was born, uh, and it's entitled "A Plan for Britain." Now here is Britain losing the war, with every possibility that there won't be a future for Britain, setting out this extraordinary plan for Britain in its most popular you know, news weekly magazine, which, at that, which actually then became the blueprint for the, for, for, for the world that we know, with the National Health Service, for the Social Security System, for, for, for planning. What we need is that sort of vision under that sort of pressure. I don't see it at the moment. It saddens me to say this. I don't see that kind of courage, that kind of moral courage, that's prepared to design a vision for Britain post uh, you know, the, the post-climate crisis uh, Britain or the post-climate crisis planet, in fact. It just at the moment isn't there. You see it fragment in, in fragments, you see it in individual speeches by remarkable people, but I don't see a kind of national will to create something that's remarkable. And even more sad is the fact that here we are living through a, a credit crisis or whatever you want, a financial crisis, which if I were God... I'm not. Were I God, I think I might have looked at the world and said, you know, you are so screwed up. I'm going to give you one last chance. I'm going to create this immense financial crisis to make you focus on and understand that that was the wrong road, that you took the wrong road, and you've got a chance to stop, pause, rethink, and look at another road. Again, my, I have deep unease that many, many, many people, people who should know better, are trying to somehow recreate the world the way it was in 2005, when actually in 2005 it was hurtling into an abyss. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, what I would say to you is, in, in a sense, in our terms, we're looking for a tipping point where the majority of people see it the, the, the different way and, and see uh, a more sustainable future. But you, you can only do that if you hold out a vision of what that sustainable future might be. Which For is, sure. I come back to this, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm using it in, the, in, a, in, a, in an OU magazine that's coming out shortly, where we've actually used the cover 
of that particular issue of picture post. You need that kind of courage. You need the ability to say, things look terrible, but they could be fantastic. It could be remarkable. And you need to say it with authority. You need to say it, as I said, with courage. You need to say it with, with absolute conviction. I don't get any sense that that exists right across our political culture at present. And I say that very sadly as a, as a Labour peer who believes passionately in my party and in what it could and should stand for. But I just don't see it. I think, unfortunately, the sheer pragmatics of politics, fear of the Daily Mail, fear of the reactionary media, has allowed us to slip back into the most, almost cautious uh, policy making, where we're, uh, we're just trying to d- solve today's crisis and managing to take our eye off the real one, which is down the road. You know, there's a wonderful lesson to learn here, isn't there? We're now dealing with the results of 25 years, roughly, 25 years of fiscal incontinence. Try to get people to understand that that will be as nothing compared to the result of 200 years of environmental incontinence, because that is the real challenge. 25 years of financial incontinence, we can get past that with extraordinary little pain eventually. We will not solve the problem of 200 years of environmental incontinence without massive pain. But wouldn't you take some encouragement from what's happened in the United States over the last uh, few months? I mean, those people that stayed up until five o'clock in the morning to watch uh, Mr. Obama win the presidency and who wept at his inauguration. So I'm, I'm not short on, um, on hope. I'm just a bit short at the moment on optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that yes. you'll accept there's a difference. Yes. <laughs> However, I let us hope that perhaps that passion and that vision um, will come along because I think as scientists we'll probably do have a role to play in that. And thank you very, very much indeed for sharing your thoughts with as, us. As scientists, could I say to you that the, uh, there are two quotes by scientists that keep me going. One is a, a quote by H.G. Uh, Wells when he said that the future, the, the future lies as a race between education and catastrophe. And the other one is uh, by Albert Einstein. He said, there's no point in trying to solve the problems of the future with the problem, with the, was it? There's no, you, can't, you, you can't solve the problems of the future with the same, with the same thinking that caused them. Exactly, I think exactly. I'm just, I'm, but if, I've got the, I got the sense of it right. I think I've got the you words have. right. You have, yes. And well, I think that... Both men were profoundly right. They were right. And I think that goes at the very heart of complexity, which is what, of course, we started with. That's where so we started. So thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Thank you.